I'm David with the Australian Student Christian Movement. We're about to have a discussion with members of the UQ6 Society. And we're actually in a very multi-faith area. Across the street from where we are is a Bosnian mosque, and around the corner from there is a Lutheran church. And we're now going to have some members of the UQ6 Society show us around. I'm Lakhvir Singh um, from the UQ6 Society. We're here today um, at the Logan um, Brisbane Sikh Temple. Um, we're going to show you inside today and a bit of what we do. First off, we start off by taking our shoes off. Leaving our shoes outside along with our egos. So the next thing we do before we enter the temple is wash our hands and our feet as a mark of respect for our group and bring a clean slate from which we can take our Guru's teachings with us. We'll get Guru Sahaj to explain to you um, the practice of Sikhi as we do it inside the Gurdwara. I'm going to show you inside the Guru's Darbar how the Sikh practice takes place, so follow me along. In the Guru's Darbar, Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj is a living sovereign and the Guru for us. As a mark of respect and love for us, we treat, treat them as a living, living Guru and not just as a holy book. We go in front of Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj and we bow in front of him to show our love and respect for him and to take humility with us. This is the langar hall, that's where we cook the, uh, the langar and here you can see all the offerings are all voluntary so the, so the disciples or the Sikhs who come to the Gurdwara they bring along the groceries that's needed for the, for the langar. So I'll show you around where we cook the langar. So this is the mammoth place to cook uh, rice because on many occasions the, the people who eat langar you know, far exceeds thousands of people on, on the special days. These are you know, all done voluntarily and everyone is welcome to eat without any distinction to caste, religion, ethnicity. So if you want food, langar is free for you. While the langar is being served, um, in the background is an um, army of volunteers helping out in cleaning, um, performing selfless service, which is one of the core concepts of Sikhism or Sikhi. Hello, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. I'm here with members of the uh, UQ6 Society. Please tell us a little bit about your club. So UQ6 Society, a lot of our members are migrants to the country. They're age 17, 18 years old, in a new country, don't know anyone. We help them, we create a community where they can ask any questions, receive any support they want. We are like family. We also have sporting events. We all study a lot, all at university, we need to get the blood pumping. <laughs> so it's that, and that also enforces the community as well. And then we also have spiritual events where we decide on what topics we want to talk about, anything we want to know more about, something we want to explore. And we sit there and we discuss it. And we actually have a lot of fun. We welcome all different opinions, whether they're contrasting or, you know, and we talk them through, try to understand each other better without judgment. So that's pretty much what we, the role we serve within the UQ community. <laughs> And can you tell us about the Sikh faith more generally? In terms of Sikh faith, um, we start, you can break it down in terms of um, three basic concepts. So like the spiritual practice of Sikhi or um, Sikhism, right? Um, in terms of the, so I'll say these are Punjabi words, but I'll explain what they mean. Um, so Kirtgaru, Vanshako, Namjapo. So Kirtgaru basically means to earn an honest living. Um, and that's at the essence of Sikhi, so earning a truthful, honest living um, in your everyday life. Um, and then two, Vanashoko is to share that living. So part of it um, is a concept for this one, um, having 10% of your income um, for the society, for example. Um, you can contribute it to charity, um, doing that work, or you can cont um, contribute through your own time. Um, and the Nam Japo is looking at everyone as that entity of God. Um, and that's where the other two principles stem from as well. So um, believing that all 
or everyone in the human race is equal as an equal. It also teaches you a way of life, like with um, get gunna, like honest work. We take that into our future careers. Like I'm personally doing business management. I'm going to HR. I'll be helping within my company. That's something that I would want to do. And then um, Lindy Pierre, she's doing medicine. So she would go into the healthcare side, like helping others. So I feel like that's how it links into. It. Yes, there is that spiritual bit where like Nam Japo, that's remembering God of the Almighty. Um, but there's also it teaches you a way of life. Like there's other aspects that you can cover with it. It starts with starts with Nam Japo. It's remembering God, and you take that remembrance of God and appreciating everyone's qualities that we are all one. We're from the same light. So never deceiving anyone to earn a living. It's honest that you treat everyone like family. That's just the way you interact <clears throat> with the world around you. So it's honest living in that we don't you don't deceive anyone. Everything you earn, every single penny is honest. Is there another part of faith you wanted to talk about or, or, or mention? It's a key, you know, stands for us uh, to stand up for social justice and human rights. So just yesterday, it was the 400th uh, uh, birth anniversary of the ninth Guru. So the ninth Guru propagated this philosophy that, you know, everyone is equal, or the Sikhi philosophy is that everyone is equal and everyone has the same light. So back in the days when the Indian subcontinent was on, under uh, oppressive rule, and there was a uh, you know forceful conversion from one faith to the other. The ninth guru to you know to tell their Sikhs or to set an example for us the Sikhs that it is our moral duty to stand up for others' rights, not just for ourselves. He sacrificed his life to protect one faith from not converting to another. So that just you know that maintaining that social balance, social hierarchy, or, or social equality is one of the the the, the central axiom of Sikh faith and what we stand for. And what would be some of the sort of misconceptions that people have about the Sikh faith? Well, one of the, the most uh, visible one is our visible identity. We are a visible minority and we, as a part of our uh, religious practice, we, we have an uncut beard and we are the men's sport turban. So, you know, people identify with, you know, what's happening in the world right now. People identify a person wearing, person having a beard and a turban with a terrorist or a Taliban. So this is one of the biggest misconceptions because 99% of the people in the world that you see around, you know, in your streets or on the television, they are Sikhs, but they are, they are classified as terrorists. So that's that's identity, mistaken identity is one of the you know, biggest misconceptions that we have. So any more misconceptions about the Sikh faith? A lot of population thinks that Sikhi is a uh like a mixture of Hinduism or um, a part of Hindu Hinduism and um, Islamic um, religion. However, we are a distinct religion. We do have our own values, like mentioned before, like the three um, uh, main principles. And we also do have our own practices that form Sikhism. Just to add on one, what uh, Ramik said, because you know, Sikhi was founded in the Indian subcontinent Punjab region. And uh, at the time, or to this day, the dominant religion is Hinduism and Islam. So that cultural, the cultural part that we share with other religions often construed as, you know, uh, as a, a religious philosophy rather than a cultural aspect. So that's a big misconception that, you know, that needs to be addressed. Can I ask you a question? What do you know about Christianity? It's what we've learned in like schools, but like it was founded by Jesus. And then there are several groups of like sort of differing views within Christianity as well. And yeah, and they differ from like liberal to conservative and yeah, it's about that. What about the rest of your sort of? From my experience, I've just um, experienced like mass in school, um, the prayers and then I haven't really learned much about the like the philosophy or the um, the education part of it really mm -hmm. like yeah even from school I think it's just, it's just the physical aspect of it not the philosophy mind I haven't really learned about that yeah. mm -hmm. I think that's the same we were only told about it when like Christmas came along these are the things that are highlighted to us about Christianity mm -hmm. I think for me personally it was uh, the political realities of the day because Roman Empire was in the power and they had the, the same uh, oppression on the populace and how Jesus stood for the, stood against that oppression and how that culminated in him be, uh, Jesus being crucified at the end and just that plot that you know how we how we can relate 
that oppression throughout times. Even in Sikhi, we have numerous examples where oppressive regimes, you know, they try to uh, subdue a, a population or the uh, the part which didn't agree with the ruling class, and you know how they were crucified or they were martyred. So just that continuing flow of philosophy that you know the things just remain the same throughout the centuries. So yeah, that was, that's something I can relate with. But when did you like? I know we just had Easter, so you would have heard a lot about Christianity in the news. But before Easter. What was a new story you heard about Christianity? I went to a Christian school back in India, so a lot of things that I learned were from there. So there was a church in school. We did a lot of prayers in the morning and a lot of priests and the teachers, they were Christians, so they gave us a little overview. Once again, I don't know the philosophical side of it, but yeah, just the basics. So that's how I know a little mm. bit about it. So yours doesn't come from sort of from the news, it's more of that, that experience. Yeah, that more of an experience, yeah. And for those of you who sort of hear about Christianity, or you don't hear about Christianity much in the news? No, but I, you do. It's interesting how Christianity affects politics. With ScoMo saying about Hillsong. Mm -hmm. That's I, the only thing I Yeah, hear. that's the Hillsong recent. And ScoMo. Yeah, yeah, and it was really interesting to see how that played out on the news, how he just kind of denounced it, but it was like, that, that was it. And it was obviously he was lying. So it's just, you, you only hear the polarizing things on the news, not the good aspects, you know, that's for anything. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of my only view of Christianity. And then there's also um, Indigenous people in Canada and the Pope apologising for that. And that's always, I think recently that was in the news as well. Seeing how it influences some of our policy making is yeah. interesting. Yeah. In the US, I feel like it's much more obvious mm -hmm. in some cases. Mm -hmm. well, it's like religion versus state. Yeah. So. You see a lot of stories about the US and, and Christianity and politics. So, yeah. yeah. Especially like abortion laws yeah, and that yeah, recently. Yeah. I think that's something I like I'm interested in and actually follow a bit more. So it's just interesting to see how they interplay. But what about Christian charities? I guess like the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. um, Saint Vincent's. They're not actually a Christian organization. A lot of people do think that because the cross, <laughs> yeah, the Red Cross, but yeah. no, they're not actually a, a religious organization. And they're telling you every day, I guess. Yeah. So you said <laughs> Saint Vincent's Saint Vincent's. Yeah. yeah. You can see the bids around and mm -hmm. um, any other ones that come to mind? I mean, there's a lot of clubs in UQ in general. Mm -hmm. Like when we have our market day, we get side by side like um, Christian clubs. There's quite a few. So I'm not sure, sorry, like who they are, like mm -hmm. which side of Christianity they're representing. But yeah, there's a lot of um, clubs there. And um, when we, oh, that's a different topic. Sorry. No, no. no I was gonna <laughs> include the floods bit, but you're gonna talk about it. But like, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's a segue. <laughs> Yeah, so during the recent floods this year, there were, we were also serving um, food, lunger, that's one of the things that we'll go into further soon. But there was a lot of Christian groups that were going out too, so like the groups from the UQ in general. That's all I know, sorry. No, no, so that was a good yeah. thing. So with university, Christianity at university, your, yeah. your exposure to them is with the floods? Or yeah. But in day-to-day -day life, do you have much to do with them? I mean, yeah, much about them? there's a lot of events going on, like there's pop-up stores or like um, stalls, sorry, um, these things around. Like there, we do know, like we're aware, there's a lot of people like um, when there's protests, like I said, like LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus rights. There's a lot of um, Christian um, clubs that are out there, but um, in regards to exposure that's all we know because mm -hmm. we read the signs obviously but we have never like i don't know like no, yeah, that's had, okay. that's i guess exposure. like the exposure is to you see them around yeah. and then you don't really know what's happening there yeah. like it's exposure in the basic sense of it like um what's lacking i guess is like the the communication the discussion between faith mm -hmm. um which i guess like multi-faith organization promotes Mm -hmm. yeah. There's been a, a drastic rise in uh, Christian missionaries in Indian subcontinent, and it's been in the news that you know some missionaries they are trying to force, not force convert, but you know leverage convert the local populace into Christianity. Mm -hmm. so, you know people who are from backward classes or who are economically weak, you know they they leverage their vulnerability to bring them to Christian faith. And this has also been coming to light with you know with rising Hindu national Hindu to a nationalism in India. Uh, some states have recently passed laws against uh, anti conversion and that just that whole uh, you know that whole political uh, polarity uh, in India. Yeah. So that's another factor that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. and what about when you're out in the community, churches that you go by, do you ever notice anything about them, any events that they're putting on or any anything sort of unique 
sometimes you, like if you drive by on a Sunday you notice there's a service or something but you don't really know what's happening I yeah. do like, notice the, um, the signs they have like different verses for the day oh, yes, yes. yes yeah. I do notice those like the translation for and I, mm-hmm. they always, always catch my eye mm-hmm. and one of the most uh, striking thing is that you know the translation that uh, Umit mentioned on those words in terms of philosophy they are you know very similar because as we all understand that the the, the truth is the constant in this world it's the same it's just different way of preaching in every religion so it's it's very you know i can relate with what's been said or what's been told on that board mm-hmm. yeah. so, and now before we were talking about uh, the floods and, and the sort of the, the work that six were doing can you tell us a little bit more about Um, Yeah, so during the floods we provided food, so we first had an opportunity through a restaurant to get food from them and provide students who were affected by the floods and like provide them food. And then after that day we realised there were so many other students that really needed the food and the restaurant didn't have the capacity to provide like every single day. So I guess everyone like rallied around, prepared the food on Fridays and then like the whole weekend, like everyone was really willing, like we talked to other family members. And they really wanted to help. I guess that's just that inner, like wanting to help everyone else. And yeah, so we got the food into uni, handing it out, handing it out to the volunteers that helped as well. So yeah, that was really fulfilling. So for everyone involved, yeah. So it's a concept of longer, which is free kitchen. That so it's a concept that regardless of who you are, social status, gender, any like anything that you're different, you're perceived as different, that we all sit together and we eat together and that's a radical concept it's like me sitting with the queen and the queen's eating the exact same food as me that's we're just, sitting at the same level yeah. yeah we're sitting on the floor together it was prepared by who knows who right like some people don't want certain lowly classes touching their food but we all recognize humanity as one that we all prepared the food together it doesn't matter who did it and we eat, sit and eat together. There's no point saying, oh, everyone's equal, but you need to practice it. We need to sit together and eat it. Mm-hmm. So that's what the concept is, that every food is a basic human right and no one should go without. Yeah. And seeing humanity as well, it links back to, we see God in everyone and God, God is in everyone, God is everywhere. And then a, base, a really important concept to Sikhism is duality, which is, well, a lack of duality, which goes back into there, you're not separate from God, like you're not you and God's, it's like there is no self sort of thing. So, and it links back into everything happens for a re- reason and everything is a part of God's will. So, and God's will by extension is your will then, because there is, you're not a separate entity from God. And I think that's pretty radical in terms of other religions at the time which there's a big distinction between you and God and like a lot of barriers. But in Sikhism, it's like you're one and the same sort of thing. So like you don't need a priest in the middle, basically. Yeah. If you like you have you have a direct connection with God, you are God. You don't need a middle man in there because that gets exploited quite often and it's even crept into our faith as well. Mm-hmm. And I know you're interested in Sikh philosophy. If somebody was interested in learning more about sort of Sikh philosophy, where should they start? Duality or somewhere else? Um, I think duality is a nice concept, but in terms of source material, going back to our current Guru, which is a Guru Granth Sahib, um, and you can get translate English translations for that and just going through it in order, I guess, because it's like written by the Gurus, like original material sort of thing. So if we talk about the Sikh Gurus, the first Sikh Guru was Guru Nanak Dev Ji, born in 1469 in the broader Indian subcontinent, the Punjab region. So they were the first of 10 Sikh Gurus in the physical human form. So then we get to the current Sikh Guru, the 11th Sikh Guru, and this is the eternal sovereign Sikh Guru. It's got hymns in it and it's hymns from previous Gurus, but also from other people from different walks of life who's views aligned exactly with what our faith teaches so that is the best source material there are plenty apps out there that you can just any concept you want to know you put it in like I was interested about mental health so I just put that in like I just put sadness in and it's amazing what comes up and it explains it so beautifully in a way that just makes sense it's just well, metaphors it's, it's poetry poetry yeah. it's all the Guru Granth Sahib Dear current Guru is poetry and that's why the poetry can be sung so that's the Kirtan. 
So it has rags and that's basically a melody. And that way it's sung, it's not just reading it out loud, it's an emotional connection to it. The way it's sung provokes an emotion. So it's different like keys and melodies that when you sing it, there's an extra layer of connection with what's being said. Yeah. Um, just in terms of like some of the teachings that come out of uh, current guru, I guess. Um, um, and one of them was, one that springs to mind for me is even though it might be hard to practice sometimes or like in terms of motivation, um, one of the lines explicitly says that if you're, um, what you do, what you should do today, do it now, and then what you should do tomorrow, do it today. Like be proactive is the essence of it. Um, and it's teachings like those, like you get reminded, so like um, being selfless and, but if you're reading the, the prayers, I guess, or the guru every day, you get reminded through these, these phrases or these lines to like practice those virtues. Um, for example, that was one of the concepts there. And I feel like another way to get closer to the Sikhi in general is like um, following those three fundamental um, principles that we mentioned before, like just being honest in what you do, not deceive anyone. <clears throat> and like Naam Japna, like um, one of the simplest things you can do is just saying Waheguru, like just once a day, just remembering God and like, you know, our mindship and just helping one another. I feel like that's one way to get closer to Sikhi and what it teaches us. I think another thing that's very explicit and that works very well for the newbies is to be informed of the Sikh history because all the Sikh gurus when they were in their human forms they lived in this for, for 239 years so when you read history you understand that every word that the gurus preach they practice most of themselves and then they ask their Sikhs or us to you know to do it so we can we can learn from their lives that you know if, some, if the guru has mentioned something in the hives and if we think in this day and age that it's impossible to do it, we could just look back in history because those gurus and their six at the time, they practice every single word. So history is, you know, we in our religion, we take history and the philosophy just hand in hand. One, one can't go with another. So because every, just as I mentioned example before of the ninth guru who gave his life, that just, you know, that's an example of how the gurus lived by their own word. And when you said current guru, what is the time? You don't mean current as in today? As an eternal. Yeah. So forever. So the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, it's a collection of hymns, of poetry. And it's written in a way that is difficult to tamper with. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it's written and it's compiled. And that's forever. Mm -hmm. that's, that is the truth and that is forever. So there's no point human forms, we keep on going forever. This is eternal, this is forever. Yeah. I guess the t it's, when we talk about the current guru, we're talking about the teachings. Mm -hmm. Those about like, within those words, there's meaning, there's um, those values bestowed in them and like those examples there. Um, and then you can reference them to history if you need a practical example. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter like, for example, if I, I grew up like in India for like first eight years of my life and after that here, it doesn't matter where you are, you can still take that, you can still be a Sikh, you can still be a learner, a lifelong learner. Like, um, there's a lot of the, um, the verses in Guru Granth Sahib uh, talk about learning from everything. Like, you can learn from trees, you can learn from, um, there's an example where it's like, one of the saints is, talk um one of the saints that wasn't a guru is talking about like uh, to himself like don't be don't be as hard as a rock like if someone it's a foot if you like if you're walking and someone's foot hits a rock they get injured right like in that sense like be be like the dust like be that humble and then he's like oh but then the dust sticks to you and make gets you dirty don't be like that either like and then, so you're picking values from the world around you, like the, um, I guess the, um, the we call it gun, like, but yeah. I think, it, I think it connects, qualities, back, yeah. it connects back to what uh, others have mentioned that, you know, seeing God in everything mm -hmm. and just experiencing that divine in our, in our surroundings and not just in a, in a religious temple, just every, all the time and everywhere. Mm -hmm.
And with the Sikh writings, is, is there one that you will often hear in, in a Sikh temple? So within Christianity, there are certain verses that are quite well known for amongst Christians. So in, in the, in, when in Sikh temples, is, are there readings that you'll often hear? Or, or... Yeah, I think like there's certain um, scriptures that you read during the day. Like in the you start off with like Japji Sahib, like you read that at the start of the day and then in the evening you read Rara Sahib. So there's certain sort of allocated, like you read that in the morning, you read that in the evening, you read that before you go to bed. So yeah. I think it's like as a, as a reminder for you every day to like of those values again. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of your question, so there are certain scriptures which are more familiar, mm-hmm. certain parts of the Guru that are more familiar. Um, but then you get, um, when we go, in, as we visited the Dirbar Sahib earlier, in, within the Gurdwara, um, you have the priests sing different hymns though, like, well, like on a Sunday or like any, like any evening, they'll sing different hymns mm-hmm. that they'll pick out themselves. So you, you get exposure to the, pretty much the whole Guru, but then some parts are more familiar. I just want to say in general, Sikhism is about love. So something I read, I will connect to a lot that maybe you might not connect to as much. It's, it's the passion you have for it and the love and what you fall in love with when you read it. So that for me, I will connect with more than say someone else. Yeah. Are there favorite readings that you have? Like you mentioned a few would be that love. <laughs> is there is there one that... There's one called Anand Sign, which um, basically means like song of bliss and it just um, hits different, um, especially in Kirtan. So that's when it's sung with like harmonium and tabla and instruments and stuff. And it's just, well, I really enjoy it. It's very uplifting. Yeah. One of my favorites is the Anantkar. So that's the prayer that you play when you, um, it's sung when, um, to like, how do I say this? <laughs> when, yeah, when someone's getting married. And it's not just that, it is a representation of love, but the, just the prayer itself, it's so meaningful. Like it just goes really deep into what love is, what is the connection between the two souls that are getting married, and like how you're connected in general. So it's a beautiful prayer, that one. And that, like that, li- if you're listening to it by yourself, you can. Because that prayer is essentially describing your link with God or your link with yourself because you you are the essence of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and as it's um, it's sung during marriage because it's symbolic of mm-hmm. marriage as well, like with your link with your partner. But essentially it's your link with yourself. Yeah. So. Well, if you go back to the concept of God's in everyone and you're, there's no distinction between you and God and there is no self, then it's a link between God and yeah. everyone. And you mentioned priest before. So for Christians, when they hear priest, they think somebody standing up behind a pulpit, yeah. a collar. What, what's a priest in, in the city? So we call them a grunty. The way I view it personally, it's, it's someone to help you. It could be someone to teach you to interpret the Guru Granth Sahib Ji. Like you sit there and we talk and we figure out, like, just to interpret it in a way, but you don't need that. That's the, that's the contrast I'd like to make. You might be able to explain it better. I think the pre, uh, the biggest distinction that we have with the priests is that in Sikhi, anybody who, who is you know learned with reading and understanding Gurbani can do the uh, can perform the uh, the Sikh practice in the Darbar. But where the distinction comes in that you know some people are not available all the time, so the Gurdwara, the management, they just hire a person who who can take this uh, duty as a full time thing. Mm-hmm. So that otherwise you know anybody doesn't matter their age or uh, or their uh, gender, they can they can perform the religious activity of the day. I think a good example is, for example, um, Harmeet has the 11th Guru, the current Guru, in their own house. So I suppose they're the own priest in their own house. Mm-hmm. Is that in some faiths it was if you were of a lowly status, you could not practice religion. That was just the search, the ranking of it. Whereas this, we're all equal. There isn't, no one's like worthy of having that connection with God. We are all worthy of that. So we can perform that ourselves. We don't need a middleman to say, you know, this is how you do it and I'll do it for you. And like pay me and I'll do it. Which is what it has become into. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that plays an important part. That's why there's certain prayers that we do ourselves during the day we start it off and then we finish off the day with certain prayers. Like we are meant to do it ourselves. We don't need, like obviously like there's people who can teach us, but like Sikhi teaches us to do it ourselves, like 
um, you get connected to the like prayers or God in general if you make yourself more with yourself. Yeah. You want to do it. Yeah, you love it, and you want to learn yeah. more yourself. Mm-hmm. You will do that yourself. I think how you can, uh, how you can see it is that, um, like they said, there's no middleman. So you are interacting with your guru yourself. Mm-hmm. The prayers you're doing, the guru is talking to you, and you're talking to the guru, and you're feeling it yourself. Right. It's direct connection. Mm-hmm. Guru and, meaning teacher. <laughs> and essentially it's a like it comes back to the the values, the main point, like you recognize everyone as the same. Like you basically when you're reading Gurbani, um, the scriptures, right? You're trying to find yourself in the essence of it. Yeah. I think the central goal behind all of it of the guru was to decentralize the hierarchy that existed in the in the previous times. So what happened was if there's a religious crowd and it's written in a particular language, it can only be read and interpreted by some sec- some section of the scholars, not by the general population. So that's why what Guru did, he wrote the entire Guru Granth Sahib Ji in the common language of the populace. So if anyone can read and understand it. So that just decentralization of that hierarchy was, an, uh, was another aspect of Sikhi. <laughs> and can I ask you about your sort of significant days during the year? So obviously, with Christianity, we just had Good Good Friday. And for the Sikhs, what are the sort of major uh, holidays that you have? Yeah, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, this might sound weird, but you know how uh, the month of December it's one of the most uh, most uh, important month for Christians because they celebrate uh, uh, the Christmas and, and New Year and all mm-hmm. that stuff. But for us, the Sikhs, that's like the uh, the day, the month of remembrance, because in in the month of December, you know, most of the martyr, uh, you know, the tenth guru and their sons were martyred in the month of December, and before even before that, you know, his boat was uh, siege for nine months, and hundreds and thousands uh, died with hunger because everything was cut off, and then they left their fort. They had to fight wars, and where the sons of the tenth guru got martyred. And then two of the younger sons were again martyred and they were draped, uh, draped alive. So the, the whole month of December is the month of remembrance for the martyrs. And then we have the special day of the Sakhi that just that just went by on, it's uh, usually celebrated on the 13th or the 14th of April. So that was the time when the 10th Guru founded the Khalsa. That's the religious uh, the religious order of, or the, the warrior order of the Sikh, Sikh religion. The easier way to explain the Khalsa is that, you know, how we just explained that there were 10 gurus and they they preached uh, their philosophy so none of the one guru had the different philosophy from, from the other they just uh, continued the flow of uh, knowledge through the 10th to the 10th guru but as time de- times re- re- uh, demanded uh, after the uh, after the martyrship of the 9th guru the 10th guru made it mandatory that the six need to be armed themselves and this is not to attack somebody but to defend somebody else's right and to defend our rights. So he made a, a warrior order. It's a simpler way to relate that is, you know, how we see the samurais in the Japanese culture. The Khalsa is the, the samurais of the Sikh order. So they are the warrior class who defend the rights of the others and ourselves. So that's, you know, that was again a very revolutionary uh, period in Sikhi because the Guru, by creating a Khalsa order, he eliminated all the caste hierarchies or caste structure that existed before. So everyone was equal. A man had a, had the last name of Singh and a, a woman had the name of Kaur. So everyone had the same surname, same caste, same status. So he just put all of the philosophy of the previous nine guru into one practical uh, practical order that you know we can relate to to this day. Mm-hmm. If we talk about last names, I think that's pretty important. It was that your last name linked you to your social status and your family history. So certain names you you were you dyed clothes or you were farmers, you were this, you were that. So that in itself is a form of inequality. It was just based on your name, yeah, I don't associate with you. But by making us all God and sing, that you're getting rid of that. It's just we are all one. It's just inherent in the practice that we are all one. There's no discrimination based on your family. They all carry the same last name, so it's not the Lemla brings mm-hmm. us together. Mm-hmm. Can I ask, with the kind of charity work that you do, or is there any particular issue that you focus on? So I know with some Christian churches, refugees is something very really big. We had the Palm Sunday rally recently, where it focused predominantly on refugees. Within the Sikh community, are, are there 
what are the big issues that you tend to focus on? I guess we we don't pick it. There's no picking and choosing really. Like for example, as the as a university club made up mostly of students, we like we did what we could in for example the bris- the floods recently, right? Um, or you'll see examples with the bushfires like a couple of years ago. Um, pretty much wherever there's need, like like if this if there's a sick group or if there's people Sikhs there, they'll help any pretty much anyone. Um, I guess if there, for example, refugees, if there's other groups helping refugees, we we focus on something else. Then we focus on an issue that needs the work done. Pretty much. Are there are organisations like Khalsa Aid who do help refugees. There. So it's everything, and it's yeah. Anything else that you want to say? Uh, just another common misconception. So we're uh, we're actually at a gurdwara. It's not a temple. So like a, a church is called a church, a mosque is called a mosque. This is called a gurdwara. So gurdwara translates to guru's door. So instead of using the word, word temple, it'd be better to use gurdwara. Well, thank you so much for letting us come here. Um, the hospitality was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing about your wonderful faith. So uh, we really, really do appreciate you all coming here. And thank you for those uh, watching, uh, or that will be watching uh, at home, and uh, you know, learn more about the Sikh faith, get in contact with us if you want more information. Thank you very much.